I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Lieutenant General Stephen Quast, a re recently retired three-star general in the U.S. Air Force, who served as the commander of the Air Education and Training Command, responsible for training over 293,000 students a year. Steve is a decorated veteran with over 650 combat flight hours, who retired in 2019 after a 33-year career in the Air Force with over 30 awards and decorations, including the Air Force Distinguished Service Medal, the Defense Superior Service Medal, Legion of Merit, and the Bronze Star. He joins us today to discuss the military and economic trends driving the creation of the U.S. Space Force in late 2019. So Steve, welcome, and let me start by saying thank you for your remarkable record of service, as well as your many years of space advocacy. Uh, I was wondering if, if we could start out by talking about your grand vision for America's future in space. Does the rapidly emerging commercial space industry, does that present, do you think, a, a new form of manifest destiny for America? And how does the newly created Space Force fit into this big picture for our future? Well, thank you for the time and for this opportunity. And uh, I would frame it very differently than that, uh, that, uh, you know, it, we are at a moment in time where uh, humanity has the knowledge and the engineering know-how to be able to solve some of our most difficult problems uh, and be kind to Mother Earth and be kind to other human beings. Manifest Destiny has so many negative connotations where you go steamrolling over other cultures and other um, uh, people. Uh, in ways that may benefit a certain culture or a certain civilization. And that, that is not what this is about at all. Uh, this is truly about uh, the fact that technology has always been uh, the, put, ha, ha, the key to national power and also solving people's problems. When you take a look at the arc of humanity, um, more people uh, have raised up the human condition because of technology, even though some technolo any technology can be used for good or bad. But to answer your question specifically, we are now sitting at the edge of greatness as a human race, where we can start reaching to the stars, meaning reaching up to the heavens for our resources and for the things that we need to be prosperous as human beings. And, and, and those four things are pretty simple. It's energy, information, manufacturing, and transportation. And with those four engines of prosperity, you can do amazing things. Uh, look at the automobile, look at the airplane invention, you know, look at electricity, uh, the light bulb. Uh, we all have these examples of how technology has changed uh, the human race and, and made us more prosperous and more peaceful over time per capita. Um, space is now that place where we can usher in a new era of solving our problems on earth while being kind to mother earth and being kind to each other. Wonderful. Well. So now space policy writer, Peter Gerritsen, he applauded you in breaking defense for having the moral courage to speak truth to power about the need for the Space Force. And I think this dovetails into to what you've been saying about, you know, just the, the rising tide that lifts all ships, right? This is, you know, as, as space increases, the Space Force contributes to that economic growth. Um, now, you, you've also had many supporters who did kind of a grassroots effort to nominate you as the first Space Force commander. And so I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about your role in helping to initiate the, the creation of Space Force. Yeah, so that, that's really a, a distracting conversation from really what's going on here. So this gets back to your first question as well, and that is, why a Space Force? Um, and uh, the reason is because when you take a look at history, and you take a look at when human beings went into any new market or any new venture, what you find is that the real builders of economic prosperity and development are the business people, the entrepreneurs. And they have to be able to take smart risk to do that properly. And so if you ever have a new economy that you're walking into and you do not have some form of rule of law, some guardian force, that can bring predictability. So those venture capitalists, those business people, those entrepreneurs can make risk decisions based on reward and work uh, to develop things that people need that are novel and useful to the human experience, the human condition. If you don't have that guardian force, 
then thugs, thieves, and pirates will steal it away. And, and you will not be able to go into that without war and conflict. So the reason I have advocated for a space my entire career, and especially in the last 10 years, pretty aggressively, is because as a historian and a student of human nature, of culture, and of strategy, and of technology, I see that space is going to usher in a new era of either conflict or peace. And I want it to be peace. And the only way we're going to have a peaceful space economy is if we have a space uh, element of defense. I would call it a space core uh, or a space, space guardian force uh, because that's really what it's going to do. It's not about fighting. Um, we can all fight if we need to. It's about uh, providing a, an environment where business people can make smart risk decisions because they know there is rule of law and there's somebody that will hold everybody accountable to policies that respect Mother Earth and respect every other human being, no matter what culture or nation they come from. Yeah, and that actually goes to something you've talked about at Hillsdale College. And so the, the, the next thing I was gonna ask you about was, again, the four major engines which you've described. And then you've also, you're, you're also dovetailing in that into the, the role of the Space Force, almost more like the Coast Guard, or I think you mentioned the Merchant Marine in the Hillsdale speech as well. And so, right. So basically, as we grow these four areas, transportation, information, manufacturing, and energy, then the Space Force serves as kind of a protector and, and uh, I think what, what Pete Garrison has been calling the blue water Space Force as opposed to the brown water. Correct. And uh, so historically, um, all civilizations and all industries kind of fall into ruts or habits that worked in the past. And so those ruts and habits for our economy and with space um, have served us well since the 1960s. Uh, but that rut is really a mindset where you just throw a satellite up, the satellite falls around the earth, and by doing so, it gives you GPS or it gives you your satellite phone uh, or it gives you pictures of weather and things like that, all the things that space gives us right now. Um, but we are moving into an era now where we are gonna transform the economy of space because of transportation. It would be as if before ships and sailing and deep sea navigation were invented, um, you know, the oceans were really a, 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 a great mystery, a great risk, and very, very few people, except maybe the Vikings, ventured out very far into those grand oceans. Uh, but once we invented uh, uh, sh shipbuilding, sailing, deep sea navigation, uh, it, it changed the economy of the globe because those oceans became highways to new marketplaces. Space is the same way. And what you see Elon Musk doing with transportation, where those astronauts just splashed down yesterday morning, um, you know, on, in the Gulf of Mexico, it was the first time in the history of humanity uh, that the government partnered with a private company to do aviation type access to space. Uh, and what I mean by that is in the past, the government almost required you to build the rocket and then burn it up on reentry, meaning the rocket would be thrown away. It would be like getting your car in the morning for your commute, driving to work in your car, and then burning your car to the ground at work and having to buy a new car to get back home. Yeah. That's how we built space in the past, and that's the habit when all the regulata regulations, all the congressional legislation um, and laws and r rules make you do it that way because that's safe. Yet Elon Musk had to fight the bureaucracy and fight the government. And, and even now, the, the Space Force does not want to embrace that. They want to keep doing it the old way. And so this is why this mindset of, of having a space force that really starts benefiting from the power of the private sector, those inventors out there that are doing it different ways, that are cheaper, better, faster, smarter. Elon Musk is building the Navy, if you will, or the ships, a new ocean. That new ocean will bring business to every human being on planet Earth without the need for the friction cost of a ship or a plane or a car to carry things to those people. And it will be able to be delivered from space in ways most Americans have never imagined before. You know, and that's actually, it's really interesting that you mentioned that the private sector approach to things. 
Um, I spoken with Dennis Bushnell a while ago, and one of the concerns that he voiced was, I believe he called it the standing army that NASA has to have in place. And a lot of that is driven by regulations, right? Safety regulations and standards and, and all of that stuff that goes into it. And so he, he had always said that, that you could basically, you could drop the cost exponentially. If you didn't have to have so many personnel involved, if you were able to run a lean, mean space operation. And Elon Musk is a perfect example of that. The most surprising to me has been the, the recent Starship experiments where they keep blowing them up on the pad and I, I'd asked uh, I, somebody with expertise about that in, in the space industry, and they said, well, they said, no, you don't understand. He blows them up and then he rebuilds them and they just keep doing it until they get it right, as opposed to, you know, years of planning and safety and studies and all of that stuff. Right. So no, it's exactly it's, right. But it, it really comes down to whether you understand innovation or not. So innovation requires prudent risk taking. And, and innovation, speed to market, a key attribute. So for Elon Musk, the two ways I would frame that is one, it took Elon Musk eight years to do what it would only have taken him one year if he didn't have to work with the government because the government required you know, seven years and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of studies and tests before they got to the place they needed to go to. And, um, and when, when, what Elon Musk is doing is he's discovering more rapidly. So I'll take a perfect example. Three and a half years ago, Elon Musk uh, was working on his reusable rocket, the one that can take off and then land back on the same pad that it launched from. And all you have to do is refuel it like your car and go again. And um, it, it, it didn't work, okay? So it failed. And most people, I was in the military at the time and the leadership of the Air Force said to me, see, he's reckless, you know? And, but if they had looked closer, what he did is he discovered that the problem was not the computation. It was the amount of hydraulic fluid in the system that was the problem. That discovery, he discovered for about $50 million and in about, you know, 10 weeks. It would have taken the government 10 years and a billion dollars to discover the same thing. This is why Elon Musk is first to market and nobody else has been able to keep up with them because he knows that experimentation and prototyping and taking prudent risk where you're controlling the situation, but you're pushing the technology and the engineering to its limit. That's why they blow up, but he knows the limit now. And now he can design something safe because he knows where the limit is. The government, and one of the reasons we lost the two space shuttles is uh, they would study it, study it, study it, and then it would be theoretical. And then they would build it and then it wouldn't be quite right and it would kill people. So actually, Elon Musk is doing it not only consistent with true innovation, but actually with true safety. And the, the, the fear mongers, the people that try to inject fear, uncertainty, and doubt in this will say, oh, no, that's not safe. He just blew up a rocket. That's not, that's not safe. And those, you know, everybody wants to be safe, for God's sakes. But if you wanted to drive risk to zero in life, you would never get out of bed. But then you would yeah. die of bed sores, okay? So there is risk in everything we do. The ones that are great adventurers, great pioneers, the ones that change the world are the ones that know how to take prudent risk. But the government is not good at that. Private companies are. Don't ever ask the government to run anything. The only reason we have a government is because of common defense, meaning we have to pull enough money to compete with people like China and Russia that would want to take over our government and our society and our economy if we were not strong. So don't let government do what private companies can do faster. And that's really the problem with the space journey so far is that government still wanted to have total control and do it perfectly safely. And they didn't trust Elon Musk. Finally, NASA trusted Elon Musk. And I hope the Space Force is willing to do the same thing. But right now, they still do not. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it does seem like they're sending stuff up, though. Uh, they've, they've been sending satellites up on United Launch Alliance. And, and uh, you know, and hopefully NASA's, like the Bob and Doug mission, um, you know, hopefully that starts to send the signal the right way. And so right. it, it looks like the Space Force may start reaching out. Maybe they will may work, work with the private sector as well. Yeah. More in the future. And, and I hope they do, but they're being drugged there like a horse to water and they're not willing to drink. And uh, now that they're watching the other horses like NASA starting to drink and see that they can go to space for a fraction of the cost, 
um, and, and do more with the precious taxpayer money that are given to protect this new economy, uh, I think eventually they'll drink. So this is all good news. It's just slow because uh, the, you know, the, the Air Force fought the Space Force idea tooth and nail. They, they didn't want it. Uh, and it, for, it took Congress to legislate it for our country to move forward. But that's not, shouldn't be a surprise either. We had to do that with the airplane and the Air Force. The Army did not want an Air Force. They fought it tooth and nail for 30 years. Uh, and finally, Congress acted because World War II taught us that you need a separate Space Force to have the culture to really dominate air. The same is true with the Space Force. This half step, we, we, we have a Space Force, but it still serves under the Air Force. So all the money has to flow through the Air Force processes where the Air Force thinks an airplane is the main event. And until yeah. we get the money aligned under somebody that thinks space is the main event, we will always short sheet and short change and under resource space. And that's dangerous because if China gets there first, the power they'll have economically, militarily, and informationally will be almost impossible to beat if we are not there with them. Yeah, and so, well, and I, I do want to touch on China, but before that, I wanted to come back to the technology part. Um, now, in, in the speech, again, at, at Hillsdale, you mentioned, uh, you, you talked about technology that exists uh, to deliver any human being from any place on Earth to any other place in less than an hour. And, yeah. and you've also described some pretty revolutionary advances in beamed energy capable of potentially charging mobile devices, even electric vehicles, with what sounds like just directly from space. I'm wondering if you could tell me as much as you're able to share about those. Sure, so uh, this conversation is, is a hard one because it would be like you and me sitting down in uh, 1898, where we are, uh, I'm in an old a cabin here in uh, the mountains of Idaho right now. And uh, you know, there's a pot belly stove right there, lit, you know? So back in 1898, Houses were lit with candles. Uh, they were heated with potbelly stoves, and you would ride your horse to work. And when the sun went down, you went to bed. And when the sun got up, you, went, you got up. It was before electricity was there. And so if I sat down with you in 1898 in this cabin and said, within 100 years, there will be two cars in every garage. There will be roads to everywhere, when at that time there were really no roads other than horse trails. Um, you will fly anywhere. It takes you th more than three hours to drive. Uh, there will be a man on the moon and you'll have computers that can do the computation and have access to information for the entire knowledge base of humanity. Uh, you would have taken me out and, uh, and uh, put me in prison for being a crazy man, okay? So I know this is a hard conversation to have, but we have the evidence that it's happening. So I'll take just two. I'll take information and energy. So information. Uh, China is already doing this, and so is Elon Musk. A network of satellites where you can actually take your cell phone, and you the cell phone is tricked into thinking the satellite is um, a cell tower. So um, uh, oh, Link okay. uh, is a company. Uh, Charles Miller is the you know the founder of that company that already has those satellites up there, and my cell phone can see that satellite and say that's a that's a cell tower. And now I can text from anywhere on planet Earth, just like I can get GPS from anywhere because it's using space as its antenna, as its infrastructure. And you don't have to build a lot of expensive towers on every mountaintop to go into every valley. So as you're driving through the canyons of Colorado, you can see things. So think about the telecommunication market, a multi-trillion dollar market, yet it's shackled with a terrestrial way of delivering where you got to build cell towers uh, in every place in the, in, on the planet. You throw up 46 satellites in a const the right constellation, and now everybody on the planet has access to texting and Wi-Fi and bandwidth. So see how the transformation there is going from a linear network to a, 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 a from a linear process to a network process. So that's the technology of information that people are already aware of. Uh, people are already putting satellites up, like Elon Musk saying, "We're going to give you Wi-Fi from space," and it's really going well. And you know, the experimentation that uh, Elon Musk just did uh, last month is showing the kind of bandwidth and access you're getting from space on any device, okay? Let's talk energy. Right now, up in the X-37, which is that little tiny space shuttle that the military uses for experimentations, they are showing the feasibility of beamed energy, where what, what this is for most Americans that are not tracking it is, we know how to take energy from the sun, and if you have a satellite up there that can see the sun 
24 seven, you take that infinite energy of the sun that is so massively hot, you can translate it into radio waves like your FM AM radio or your Siri satellite radio. And it can be received by any device, energy received by any device. Now we haven't made the devices. It would be like having a light bulb in your house and no power lines or AC DC electricity from Tesla and Edison to bring you the light. But we know how to build this. We just haven't built it yet. Now China sees this too. And they know that the energy market globally is profound. I grew up in Cam West Africa, a small tribe with no electricity, no water. So I know of what I speak when I say that Americans are blind to how few people on this planet have access to energy, electricity. The trillion dollar market that's out there in Africa, in Asia, and in places that do not have infrastructure for electricity is so massive. It's a tr trillion dollar market. And China is putting up their satellites that be, take the energy from the sun, they translate it into radio wave, and they're gonna flood the world with these devices that can receive that energy, and you never have to plug a device into the wall ever again. So that is coming to humanity. It's a new way of energy, just like Tesla and Edison gave us a new way of electricity with AC and DC back 100 and some odd years ago. That same revolution is coming to our planet and it's coming very fast. And China will have their infrastructure up in space. The question is whether America is going to be in that market or we're going to just give that trillion dollar market to China and say, well, it, it would be like us uh, saying, no, we're not going to build that important. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that so that brings me to that. I mean, that brings me to China, and I have a whole series of questions on this. And I, I don't. I know that there is a concern. I don't want to be too negative on China. I know you don't as well. But yeah. um, I mean, one of the concerns that you voice publicly is the rapid chase, the rapid pace of China's space program development, um, the fact that they haven't missed a milestone in over thirty years of space development. And they're on a trend line to pass us technologically. And so one of the things that, that you've discussed was um, basically like China reaching the ultimate high ground and potentially putting up roadblocks to prevent competitors like us from reaching that. I'm wondering um, how likely do you think that is to happen and what kind of roadblocks do you think they might put up? Well, um, my past performance civilization to predict future behavior. And when you take a look at what the Chinese do to people that they can control, like the Uyghurs, turning waves, uh, to anybody that has a religious belief where they will uh, persecute them and they will alienate them and ostracize them from the society. Look at Hong Kong. Uh, look at the Tibetan monks or anybody in Tibet. Um, the reality is this, that China in their written word, in their doctrine, and in their vision, have a clear intent of using space as the economic high ground and power ground to control and dominate the global economy, okay? And when they do, when they can hold us at risk by saying, no, up here in space, and they have the power to do something about it, I have no faith that they will immediately change their behavior and not behave like they have, like in South China Sea, for example, where they said, oh, these little islands we're going to build in South China Sea, that's just for some of our economic uh, development. We are not going to do anything to make any claims, and we're not going to weaponize it. We're not going to put any military forces there. And not only do they claim all the waters around, uh, you know, the, the South China Sea and into the machine right and all the other um, countries that have the international rule of law, but they have also weaponized those islands. And now they're saying, America, don't you dare come here because this is our South China Sea now and you can't sail here. So you can see how space, if past, is any predictor of future performance, that if China gets to space and is not just having satellites falling around the Earth, because that's not what they're going to do. They are going to maneuver outside of the gravity well between the Earth and the Moon and Mars. And they're going to build transportation hubs to bring water and other resources in space to Earth. And they are going to be able to dominantly maneuver 
and deliver energy through that solar power technique. They'll be able to deliver energy to any space vehicle or any device on planet Earth. And that capability to deliver energy, any device or any spaceship or any um, robot that's in, in space or on Earth can in a millisecond be turned into a weapon that obliterates whatever it is they're pointing at. And this is the mm. real danger of space, is it, the dual use technology, if we believe that China will always be benevolent and it will always respect mother nature and other human beings that believe differently, then we'll be just fine letting China lead that new economy. But if we see China polluting the earth, which they are, 80% of their wells right now are so toxic you can't drink out of them. Look at smog. Uh, look at what they do to other people that don't believe the way they do or are not willing to subjugate their freedom to the Communist Party. Or if you believe in religion of any kind, that you are persecuted in their society. Um, when they have that kind of control in space where they can deliver energy and information to anybody, and in a millisecond, if they don't like what you're doing, they can turn it into a weapon that can obliterate you. See how long it takes for them to not like what America is doing, where we believe in freedom of religion, and we believe in the freedom of speech. Um, the first time we say something that's unkind to China, uh, they will stop it, just like they're trying to stop it with TikTok and Yik Yak and other uh, technologies of information, where they steal the information and use it against you. So this is really an important conversation where we, as an American society, need to be mindful of this journey into new technology and new power that has not existed ever before, and be careful that the, the Chinese people are beautiful, uh, the Chinese culture is rich and is, has invented more for humanity than any other society. But the Communist Party has historical examples, whether it's Hitler or Venezuela or Russia. You take a look at how this president of China believes in what Marxists, Stalin and Lenin and Mao all believed in, that the only way to sustain the survival of a society is by having the people subjugate their will to the power of the party for long-term survival, to know that uh, this will not end well if America is not in a power position in space. Yeah. Now, you've also talked about a space navy with the equivalent of battleships and destroyers that, that China has, is, is in the process of assembling. I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about that. So this gets back to mindset. So when I say battleships and destroyers, most people think of the industrial age model of a battleship and a destroyer in the World War II movies. I'm, I'm, talking, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the outcome that those battleships and aircraft carriers have, meaning that if there's a battleship and an aircraft carrier somewhere, people behave themselves because that battleship and aircraft carrier can actually do something to stop evil people from behaving badly. So when you think about what China is doing in space, where they are designing dominant maneuver, where they can maneuver faster and cheaper than you can, they are designing dominant power, meaning energy from the sun beam to any point. It can be peaceful beaming power. It can be a laser beam that can obliterate, and it can be changed from one to the other in a millisecond. And dominant communication, where they are putting up a communication hub so they can communicate around the moon and around Mars, and around all of space. Um, when you can dominate maneuver, power, projection, and communications, it's the same as having battleships and aircraft carriers across the open oceans of the globe, I where see. America is the one that can hold people accountable that do evil things. If China is the only one up there in space, and America comes up there with no power, but we want our entrepreneur to do something useful for humanity, and China doesn't like it because they, it's not benefiting their economy, all they have to do is stop us, paralyze us. It's done in a different way, but it's, it's just as lethal as a battleship or an aircraft carrier. It's just modeled in the 21st century. That's why this is hard to understand. Just like the, the, the people in 1800 could not envision um, aircraft carriers, battleships, airplanes, and spacecraft and computers and cars on every road. It's hard for most people to envision space where China owns all the power, all the maneuver or transportation, and all the communication in the sense that if they don't like what you're doing, 
they can stop you. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying there. That so it's it, it's and this so this is a paradigm shift. And so one of the things that you've said is it's not about the technology, it's about the strategy. And you spoke about England losing an entire generation of young men um, just because they, they didn't understand the advent of the machine gun of poison gas. And so it, it sounds like I think this paradigm shift is tied to a change in strategy. Um, you know, where, where a lot of people maybe are looking at it, they're, they're considering it to be similar to the space race in the 60s. But it's it's not. It's a different game, right? Does that? It, it is. It is a different game. And so this is this is the message that needs to get to every American ear and anybody sitting in the White House. And that message is hard to get there because most businesses are designed to make money on the old way, and most uh, government officials are not told the ugly truth until it's too late and there's a crisis there. And this happened to France between World War One and World War Two, and it's happening to us now. So here is what every American ear needs to hear and what the White House needs to understand. Everything we are building, every ship, every tank, every plane we are building out there uh, has the potential of being paralyzed by what China is building. So we might build a better satellite. We might build a better fighter aircraft. We might build a better aircraft carrier. But it's like France building the wall to keep Germany out. And Germany invented Blitzkrieg to go around the wall, and they were in Paris. Paris fell in three weeks. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, so here we spend all our time and effort refining the perfection of an aircraft carrier or a short-range fighter or a tank. And China can paralyze it from space by just turning off the electricity because we build them so dependent on computers, on computer chips, and on electricity. And that is what China is going to dominate from their space network, where they can look at an aircraft carrier and they can literally manipulate the electromagnetic spectrum in a beam that will turn off every electron on that ship. And that ship turns from a, a $10 billion aircraft carrier bristling with power to a cork in the water. Or a fleet of F-35s on the ramp somewhere in Guam, and none of them can even start their engines because yeah. China, with very low price points, can look down and say, okay, I don't want any of those fighters to take off from Guam, and they beam the right electromagnetic waveform to that ramp, and every one of those F-35s cannot even start up. That's what we're building. That's what people are not aware of, and that's, uh, and that's why people get upset, because Lockheed Martin, you know, who builds the F-35, doesn't want to hear that, yet, the government never asked them to build a, a machine that would you know, be resilient to the electromagnetic spectrum being used as a weapon. Um, and so this is why this is, these are dangerous words, but we live in dangerous times. And I do not want to be France, where we wake up in 10 years and China can paralyze any of our military or economic infrastructure, whether it's a power grid in San Antonio, Texas, or a, uh, a battleship or you know, an aircraft carrier in the South China Sea. I don't want us to wake up in 10 years and all of a sudden the power that we've been building is impotent. The American people will look around and say, who the hell were the strategists that didn't understand that it's not about better technology. It's about a strategy that can beat the other guy to the high ground of power. I see what you're saying. And, it, and, and if we want it to be done consistent with our constitution where we value mother earth, and we value other people that believe differently, America must lead us in there. But if you want it to be defined, all the rules in space and this power environment, this economy, if it be defined where religion is not allowed, freedom of speech is not allowed, uh, freedom uh, to own land, and to be the, the, the person that defines your own happiness in the way you want, where you can go where you want and see what you want, if you want all of that gone, then let China lead into this space because they will do that to you. If you believe in God, they will find a way to not let you have credit, not let your kids go to the good schools, not let you shop at the good markets where the good food is, not travel to see the beauty of this earth. That's what they do to their own people. That's what they will do to Americans if they own the energy market, the information market, the manufacturing market, and the transportation market of space. Yeah, now you've studied China a lot. And one of the things that you talked about was 
the, the 600 year journey to the century of humiliation. And I thought that was, I, I thought that was really intriguing because um, it, it seems like that kind of goes to the mindset, I guess, that might be driving the Communist Party. And I believe you'd also said that they, they have a renewed plan to declare victory in space by 2049, which I believe is the 100 year anniversary of the Communist Party. I, I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit yes. about a, a little bit about maybe some of the mindset, I, I, and this goes back several hundred years, right? But they had an empire that went into decline, and the 20th century was definitely not easy for them. And, and so I, I, I'm wondering, right. since you've studied that, how does that how does that shape itself yeah. into today's party? So this is why you know Americans. I, one one thing we should love about our culture is, is that we trust people and we believe the best in other people. Okay. We trust people and we believe the best in other people. That is a beautiful thing. That is a God thing. And we should never give that up. Um, but uh, China does not believe that. They, they do not believe that. In other words, they believe that eventually, if you give people freedom, and they point to the West, if you give people freedom, look at what happen is happening in America. Uh, this COVID-19 is causing them to fight amongst themselves. They're tearing themselves apart. They're riding in the streets. They don't respect their president. Um, and they say, see, that's what happens if you give freedom to people, to individuals. What you need is a central government, a communist government that can control people to the right limit. It's like you can have freedom, but you're a bird in this cage and the government defines the cage and you can fly around in that cage and be happy. That's the only way to survive long term. That's how they think. So when Kissinger and when Clinton, you know, when we went to China and when we let them into the World Trade Organization, we were doing what great Americans do. We were trusting China that we could evolve together peacefully and we could bring them into the World Trade Organization and, and, and treat them like a third world country that they were at the time and that they would grow. And once the, the Chinese people access to free information, they would throw off the shackles of tyranny of the Communist Party. And we learned the hard way, what historians have always known, that a mindset of communism will use propaganda to teach the young generation this mindset that the only way to be free is to be a happy bird in the cage of communist control. Because if you fly out of that cage, you'll be eaten by human nature. And look at the West, they're eating themselves up. So here we argue amongst ourselves as a society. Yet, as our, as our competition is designing and arguing over petty things, um, and and uh, we are, like we'll say, a society dies because of a lack of vision. So here, this gets to the 600 year story we're talking about. And every American ought to recognize this story as you listen to it. 600 years ago, the Chinese at the beginning of the Ming Dynasty or in the Ming Dynasty um, had two political parties that were fighting like cats and dogs. Does that remind you? of what's going on right now in America. They, and they hated each other so viciously that the party in power decided it would build a Navy. So they built some of the best ships because they believed that if they built a strong Navy, they could control the markets of the globe in a way that benefited China. They would have been the England of the world had they succeeded. But guess what happened? The party that built these ships for commerce in the open oceans, lost power to the other party. Mm -hmm. And the other party hated the party that created this so much that they burned the ships to the ground. And so Americans need to be careful that if, if uh, you know, that we do not do the same thing because China looks at that decision where they let petty politics destroy the most important and powerful economic engine of transportation, information, manufacturing, and, um, and, and, uh, and energy, um, that China shot itself in its own foot back in 16 or 600 uh, or, or 1604 and, um, or 1406 rather. And, and when they did that, um, it, you can map the slow degradation of the power of China that ended in the hundred years of humiliation where the West came in and the opium that the West uh, flooded the Chinese market with destroyed an entire generation of Chinese minds and Chinese hearts. It was a travesty. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, there are people in our country that then question now, well, how, how did we allow 98% of our antibiotic pharmaceuticals be made in China? How did we allow 80% of our pharmaceuticals introduced in China, at least the seed corn for those pharmaceuticals? How did we let telecommunication go to China such that they bankrupted Motorola, Lucent Technologies, and Nortel to build Huawei out of the carcasses of great American countries that were bankrupted by Chinese theft? Um, and, and so China talks about this. If you, if you translate many of their Mandarin docu documents, China talks about the fact that they are angry as hell about the fact that <clears throat> China uh, shot itself in the head by canceling its fleet of ships that would have dominated global economy that led to the hundreds of humiliation where the Western culture destroyed, almost destroyed the Chinese society. And they are back and America is in the crosshairs and they are gonna descend on the West, the same carnage that they felt through the century of humiliation. Um, wow. So there is deep, deep animosity against Western culture. So Xi Jinping in a speech in 1998 said these very words, the Western way of thinking is an existential threat to the survival of China and China must defeat the Westphalian Western model of governance and that Western governance will crush under its own stupidity. And he points to our chaos right now in the streets of America as an example of how markets and free people will always eat themselves alive. They, they will destroy themselves. And China, they just have to tip us over. They don't even have to fight. That's what China wants. They do not want to fight with America. They want to strangle us economically and let us crush under the weight of our own stupidity. We have a choice yeah. as an American society here. We can understand the trends of history, the trends of technology, the trends of culture, and we can embrace the Chinese culture and the Chinese people, but reject the Communist Party, which is the perfect instrument of death, of any freedom and any liberty. And we can evolve to a human race where we reach the heavens through space for those blessings that uplift all the human condition. And we can do it being kind to Mother Earth and kind to other people. Or we can let China lead and we will be the victims of exactly what we deserve.